J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Are You Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, have you a treat in store for you. What a grand surprise the moment you discover Jell-O's new locked-in flavor. Never until now has any gelatin dessert been able to bring you so much delightful goodness. Because up until now, gelatin desserts constantly faded in flavor while waiting to be used and brought you only a shadow of their original richness. But that's all been changed. Today, Jell-O's tempting, tantalizing flavor is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles where time can't get at it to steal it away. No matter how long Jell-O remains in the package, it retains its luscious flavor to the very last. Now, you be the judge. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice the absence of any heavy, fruity aroma, the usual sign of escaping flavor. Then dissolve Jell-O, and presto, there's your flavor, all of it, the full-strength flavor of Jell-O, as rich and vivid as the day it was locked into Jell-O's delicate crystal-like particles. So try Jell-O. Now made better than ever by Jell-O's new locked-in process. The flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. Ready, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, next Friday, October 31st, is Halloween and will be celebrated by gay parties throughout the land. Yes, sir. We'll play games and everything. So tonight, we bring you a man who always loses his bridge bobbing for apples, Jack Benny. Thank you. Uh, Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, <laughs> that was a very funny introduction. Uh, losing my bridge, bobbing for apples. <laughs> uh, did you think of that all by yourself? Yes, I did, Jack. It was my own little brainchild. Well, it certainly is clever. I mean, the way you expose all my faults and my defects. <laughs> <laughs> People enjoy it, too. Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> hmm. You know, Don... They have a program out here where a man sits by himself in a small room and plays phonograph records all night long. Uh, he's called Hank, the night watchman. Uh-huh. Well, one more introduction like that, and you're going to be known as Don, the Decca Day Man. <laughs> In other words, I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to start a flame with your contract. <laughs> uh, by the way, Don, uh, getting back to Halloween... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. How are you? Uh, getting back to Halloween... Oh, oh, fine, thanks. Uh, getting back to Halloween... You didn't have to answer me, you know. What's that for? Coming in so mad. What's the matter with you today? Well, you know that new usher they got at the reception desk, that tall, good-looking fellow? Yeah. When I came in just now, he winked at me. Oh, a fresh guy, huh? He's not going to take me out tonight. Well, I don't blame you. I asked him, but he's busy. <laughs> All right, so much for romance. Now, Don, uh, what were we, uh... Oh, you mentioned something about Halloween. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, are you going out with us next Friday night and have some fun? You know, ring doorbells and everything? Oh, I don't know. You don't have the excitement nowadays that you used to have on Halloween. Ah, I guess you're right. Well, I remember back in Denver when I was a kid, we used to have the time of our lives. Denver? You should have seen the way we celebrated Halloween in a little country town like Waukegan. The old-fashioned pranks we used to play. But kids don't have fun like that anymore. What do you want, plumbing or fun? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> gosh, Don, the, the things I used to do in those days. I'll never forget one Halloween. You know, I was a little boy then, and I, I took the chop suey sign off a Chinese restaurant and nailed it over the front door of our house. <laughs> oh, boy. Huh? The chop suey sign, huh? Was your father mad when he saw it? No, he just hung a tail on his derby and went into business. <laughs> 
Well, that's how my sister Florence came to be known as Lotus Blossom. <laughs> we had some restaurant, chopped liver and suey. <laughs> and then the uh, following year, <laughs> the following year, oh, oh, hello, Phil. Are you coming out with us Halloween? Yeah, Jackson, but I can't meet you until after 9 o'clock. I got to go to night school. Oh. Well, I'll tell you what, Phil. We'll meet you in front of the school about 9.15. How's that? Okay, I'll bring my long pants with me and slip them on. What? Now, wait a minute, Phil. Don't tell me you wear short pants to night school. Look, Jackson, I'm in third grade and I'm going to dress like it. <laughs> oh, by all means. Third grade, eh? The rate you're going, you'll get your social security and diploma on the same night. <laughs> no kidding, Phil. Uh, why don't you, uh, why don't you give up night school? Nothing doing. I don't want to be a maroon. <laughs> That's moron. <laughs> Look, Phil, just wear your short pants all the time. Say, I wonder, um, I wonder if Dennis wants to come along Friday. Where is the kid, anyway? I called him yesterday, and his mother told me that he's been asleep ever since we got back from New York. Well, I'll be done. See, I didn't know the kid was so lazy. What do you mean, lazy? You made Dennis share your berth on the train, then you snored so loud he couldn't rest for four nights. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mary. It's impossible for me to snore because I recently had my adenoids removed. I had an operation. Some operation. Rochester hasn't even got a license. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. You thought he couldn't build me a barbecue pit either. <laughs> you should see it. Say, Don, speaking of our trip, I meant to ask you, is your wife, um, is your wife still mad at me for putting you both in one berth? Well, I thought she was, Jack, but strangely enough, as I was leaving the house this morning, she handed me a cake. A cake? Yes, she baked it especially for you. Especially... For me, eh? I'll give it to you right after the broadcast. Hmm. Well, especially for me, eh? <laughs> well, thanks very much, Don, but you see I'm on a diet right now and I have to cut out fattening poison. I mean cake. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, though. Huh? Oh, Jack, don't be silly. Mrs. Wilson wouldn't poison you. She's one of the nicest girls I ever met. Listen, Mary, I saw a show in New York called Arsenic and Old Lace, and two of the sweetest old ladies you ever laid your eyes on bumped off a dozen men. <laughs> Twelve of them. Yes, but they gave them elderberry wine. What you can do with wine, you can do with cake. <laughs> I ain't eating it, sister. Oh, Jackson, don't act like a baby. All right, Phil, let's drop the cake and have a band number. Tell Peggy uh, thanks, Don. Well, how about a number, Phil? What are you going to play? Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You won't laugh if I tell you, will you? No, no. What's it going to be? Port and Peasant Overture. Are you kidding? Well, let's have it. I may be sorry I didn't eat that cake before this is over. <laughs>
That, uh... That was a special arrangement of Poet and Peasant Overture played by Phil Harris and his peasants. There, there can't be a poet in that bunch. <laughs> that, um, that number was okay, Phil. You liked it, huh, Jackson? Yes, but I have one suggestion to make. If you're going to play a number like that every week, I think I'll have to augment your orchestra. Augment? Yes. Tell him what it means before he puts on his short pants again. <laughs> Phil, uh, augment means to increase or enlarge. For instance, you ought to add a bassoon to your orchestra and a French horn and a, and a harp. Sorry, Jackson, the harp's out. What do you mean? I had one once and all the boys hung their socks on it. <laughs> oh, well, if you had a bassoon, you could hit them over the head for doing it. Huh? <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our first play of the new season, we are going to... Well, look who's here. Hiya, Mr. Benny. Hello, everybody. Well, you certainly look rested now, Dennis. Boy, oh boy, do I feel good. You want a rat, though, Miss Livingston? <laughs> Dennis, behave yourself. Let him alone. I'll give him a toe hole so fast he won't know what hit him. Mary, put your coat back on. <laughs> Be a lady, will you? On this clam bake? How can you call this program a clam bake when Phil just played poet and peasant? <laughs> now, let's settle down. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce... Tomorrow, October 27th, is Navy Day. So tonight, in honor of this occasion, we will present our version of that stirring drama of the Naval Air Force, that epic of heroism, that sensational Warner Brothers production, Die Bomber. Uh, thank you, Dive. You're a bomber. <laughs> Hmm. Now, uh, in this sketch, uh, I will play the part of the young flight surgeon as portrayed on the screen by dashing, daring Errol Flynn, which happens to be the most important role in the picture. Now, let's see. But, Jack, I saw the picture, and I thought that Fred McMurray as the test pilot had the most important part. Who? McMurray? Yes, he did some very heroic things. In fact, the audience applauded him the night I saw it. They did? Oh. Well, Phil, then you'll be Errol Flynn, and I'm, I'm going to be Fred McMurray. I'd never drop Flynn that fast. <laughs> never mind. Now, it's all set. Phil is Errol Flynn, I'm Fred McMurray, and Dennis, you're going to be Ralph Bellamy. Oh, boy, he had the best part of the whole darn picture. Who? Bellamy? <laughs> yeah, he was a great doctor, and the whole story was built around him. Did what? <laughs> Well, now, let's see. Uh, Phil, you're going to be Errol Flynn. That's settled. Dennis, you'll be Fred McMurray, and I'll be Ralph Bellamy. Yes, that'll work out fine. Now, let's see. Uh, say, Jack. Yeah? If you ask me, Wayne Morris stole the whole picture. What, what? Who? <laughs> Wayne Morris? Yeah, he was terrific. No kidding? Well, fellas, it's all settled. I'm going to be Wayne Morris. <laughs> yeah. Good. He wasn't even in the picture. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's going on here? I'm going to play Ralph Bellamy, and that's the end of it. Mary, you're going to be a nurse, and Don, you're going to be the B-19, so stick your arms up. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, this play will go on immediately after a song by Dennis Day. Go ahead, Dennis. Hold it a minute. Come in. Oh, hello. Hello, Mr. Benny. Can I see you about that now? Uh, yes, wait out in the hall. I'll be right with you. Excuse me, fellas. Say, that little boy looks familiar. Well, don't you recognize him, Don? That's the kid who was on the train with us last week. The one that said he was going to be a gag man for Bob Hope? Yeah, now Jack is trying to sign him up first. I'm going to open up the door and listen. Shh. Sure, sure, kid. I know Bob Hope's a nice guy. But why do you want to work for him? In the <laughs> first place, he's very tough to write for. What are you talking about? I can write a thousand gags about his nose alone. <laughs> You think that's something? Listen, kid, I've got rheumatism and flat feet. And you see this bridge? Yeah. Look, it comes out. <laughs> well, I'm a cinch to write for. 
Now, what do you say? Well, what's your offer? Now, listen, kid. You're young and you've got your health. <laughs> now, look. Look, money, we won't talk about. <laughs> the heck we won't. <laughs> This kid's going to be tough, but he's clever. Now, look, son. Uh, uh, by the way, what's your name? Barton. Belly Laugh Barton. <laughs> oh, uh, well, now, look, Belly. Uh, forget hope. Uh, forget hope, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you thirty-seven fifty a week. And a case of Jello every Saturday night. How does that strike you? Well, I don't know. I'll have to talk it over with my manager. <laughs> what do you have to talk it over for? Look, kid, Jello is good for you. It's delicious. And not only that, this year it's got that new locked in flavor. <laughs> huh? Locked in, huh? Yeah. The flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. Now, sign here. Right here on the dotted line. <laughs> Come on, kid. Okay, let me out of the corner. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's a deal, kid. See you at my house tomorrow morning. Come for breakfast and bring some coffee cake. <laughs> so long. Goodbye. Here he comes, boys. Act nonchalant. Well, sorry to kept you waiting, fellas. Okay, Dennis, let's have your song. Belly Laugh Barton. See, I hope he lives up to his name. I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to start a flame in your heart. In my heart I have at one desire, and that one is you, no other will do. I've lost all ambition for worldly acclaim. I just want to be the one you love. And with your admission that you feel the same, while I've reached the goal I'm dreaming of, believe me, I don't want to set the world on fire. That was I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire, sung by Dennis Day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction of the evening, our version of that sensational motion picture drama, Dive Bomber. And I'd like to announce that this production will be done entirely in Technicolor. How, how can you do Technicolor on the radio? We're on the red and blue networks with a green cast. <laughs> And belly laugh better do better than that one. <laughs> now, the opening scene is the laboratory of the famous flight surgeon, Dr. Bellamy, who at the moment is testing the reflexes of that ace aviator, Dennis McMurray. Curtain. Music. <laughs> The uh, Schneider test shows pilot fatigue not far from the chronic line. A silograph negative. What does the Ralph from Fantamp test show? <laughs> what does it show, uh, nurse? 
Pretty bad, Doctor. Look at this chart. Hmm. I don't like it. This man's flying days are over. He's through. Washed up. You mean I'm not going to be an ace anymore? (laughs) To us, you'll always be an ace. (laughs) Now, um... Now, let's see, uh... Uh, what uh, what else is there to check on this man? Uh, why don't you test his knee, jerk? <laughs> That's why don't you test his knee, jerk? I did that already. Well, Lieutenant McMurray, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. You're grounded. No, no, you can't do this to me. I belong in the air. I've given the best years of my life to aviation. And when I black out, I want to be up there flying. Understand, flying. I knew I should have taken that part. (laughs) But I'm not beefing. This had to come sooner or later. It's just tough to step out of the ring when the main event may be ready to start. It's tough, I tell you. It's tough. No, I had to be Ralph Bellamy, stand around like a dodo. Oh, well, I motivate the story, anyway. you got to give me another chance, Doc. Do you hear? Because if you do All talk... right, all right, I'll give you another chance. <laughs> Stop acting. Get out of here. <laughs> Next time I'll see a picture before I cast it. Snap out of it, Doctor. Let's get on with these experiments. Oh, that's right. Uh, what am I working on today? Uh, you're trying to perfect a transparent parachute so you can get suntan on the way down. <laughs> no, that'll never be a success. Come in. Oh, hello, Commander Wilson. Good morning, Dr. Bellamy. I want to congratulate you on your experiments in counteracting aeroembolism. Thanks. What? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. I expect to have the arrows all embled out before long. <laughs> By the way, Commander, have you located an assistant for me? Oh, yes, Dr. Bellamy. I've discovered a brilliant young graduate of Harvard Medical School. He's uh, waiting in the room right now in the waiting room. Uh, good, uh, good. <laughs> Come in, Dr. Flynn. How do you do? Dr. Flynn, Dr. Bellamy. Dr. Bellamy, Dr. Flynn. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde, while I try. Please, Miss Crotsmere. <laughs> She's not bad. I'm pleased to meet you, Dr. Flynn. So you're a Harvard man, eh? Yes. uh, Who's the tomato? (laughs) Dr. Flynn, uh, Commander Wilson tells me... Yes, I believe I have solved the problem of counteracting Mm aeroembolism. For instance, why don't we make a bell? Well, don't you... Pneumatic. Inflated before the dive. But that would compress the upper part of the body and stop the blood from leaving the brain. It can't miss, I tell you. It can't miss. (laughs) I had to be Bellamy. <laughs> the most important part, play it. Oh, well. That's a brilliant thought, Dr. Flynn. You'll get a medal for this. Oh, I don't want a medal. I'm not doing this for any paltry reward from human beings. Consider it my contribution to the progress of aviation. <laughs> Contribution. I knew he'd louse it up. Now, look, Commander Wilson, Flynn's idea seems to be practical, but I've got a better one. What is it, Dr. Bellamy? I'll demonstrate. Hand me a pencil, Miss Crossmere. Here you are. Thanks. Don't thank me. I'm not doing this for any paltry reward from human beings. I gave you that pencil because it'll stop the blood from leaving the brain. A pencil? (laughs) What do I care about a pencil? I've got dozens of them. Dozens of them, do you hear? And consider it my contribution to the progress of aviation. <laughs> Even Crotsmere has a better part. <laughs> well, come on, Dr. Flynn. That bell of yours is a good idea. Let's get busy on it. Okay, Dr. Bellamy. 
Going Dr. Kildare. Dr. Kildare, report to surgery. That's the other feature. This is dive bomber. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Come on, Flynn. We'll make that belt or my name ain't. How high are we, McMurray? 26,000 feet and going up. Good. How does the belt feel? It's a little tight around the ankles. <laughs> well, pull it up. I tell you, Mac, this experiment is going to make me famous. Well, Dr. Flynn invented it. Why didn't you bring him along? Ouch! I'll twist your other wrist if you keep that up. <laughs> How high are we now? 30,000 feet. You better put your oxygen mask on. I took it home. I'm going to wear it Halloween. <laughs> but I feel pretty... Uh-oh. What's the matter, Doc? I don't know. I, I felt a little dizzy there for a second. But but I'm all right. How how high are we now? 31,000. 31,000, eh? I got to I got to snap out of it. I'm feeling I feel kind of drowsy all of a sudden. Doc, Doc, what's the matter? I don't know. I guess it's the altitude. <laughs> this is Altitude kind of got me. Belt. Pneumatic. It'll stop the blood from leaving the contribution. <laughs> yeah. Doc, wake up! Dr. Flynn, Dr. Bellamy. Dr. Bellamy, Dr. Flynn. Uh. Well, here we go again. <laughs> Come the whistles. <laughs> Gee, he looks so peaceful, I think I'll count sheep and join him. One, two, three, four. No, that's an eagle. Four, five, six. Next week brings Halloween, and Halloween brings fun and festivities, gay parties that call for good things to eat, like the grand dessert I'm going to tell you about right now. It's a real party treat, and yet an easy dessert to make. All it takes is a can of peach halves and a package of orange jello, and when you have those two items, you're all ready to go. Just dissolve the orange jello in hot water as you usually do. Then fill six wide sherbet glasses, about one third full, and chill. When the jello is firm, Place a marshmallow in the center of each glass and cover with a peach ham, rounded side up. Pour the remaining jello over the peaches and chill until firm. And there you have an ideal treat for Halloween, a swell dessert that will make your Halloween guests say, you surely know how to give a party. Get a can of peach halves and a package of orange jello tomorrow and make up this delicious combination. Juicy golden peaches covered with shimmering orange jello. But remember, when you buy Jell-O, be sure to look for the big red letters on the box. Because only Jell-O's new locked-in process gives you all the flavor, always. Tomorrow, when you make out your grocery list, put down Jell-O and write under it, write Jell-O puddings. Jell-O vanilla, Jell-O chocolate, Jell-O butterscotch puddings. Try them and you'll say, yes, Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles.